vocabulary is not in, kind of in our uh, not in our dictionary right now. But uh, we want to just uh, congratulate Miss Christina Hill. She she uh, nailed it. She said her grandparents had one, so we have a little prize for Christina. Christina, if you want to come up and get it, just want to thank you for. Uh, some fun little stuff for Fridays, and this Friday we're going to continue to have some fun things, and so, but we incorporate a Bible lesson in it, it's just a fun time with the kids, and you know, I, I really enjoy doing that with the kids, we've had some good feedback, and, and uh, we've had some of our kids join in on it also, and so, uh, look forward to this Friday, we'll do another one at 3 p.m. on Facebook Live. Also, just want to make a, a, a quick announcement, we're going to resume the Lord's Supper next month, we, before all the, of the shutdown, we, um, we had, uh, our schedule the first Sunday of every month doing that. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different in how we do it, and I'll put that out when it gets a little closer, but we're going to resume that the first Sunday in September as we uh, maintain that ordinance of the Lord's Supper uh, for the local churches. We remember the Lord's death and burial and His resurrection, but also His shed blood and just uh, what that means to us. And, and, you know, we're commanded to do that until He returns, and, you know, we had to put some safeguards in place, and we haven't uh, done that, but we're going to resume that next month, I believe uh, we have some good ideas that we can do that safely and, and honorably and be able to focus on the Lord that way. Let's remember to uh, also pray for one another. We have some prayer requests that have gone down. Uh, if you can remember, especially to pray for Miss Winnie. Uh, she has some things going on with her back. We put that out in a, in a text and sent it down the prayer chain. And so remember to pray for her this week and, uh, and for the following week. She's got some challenges there. And I know that would really encourage her. As we pray for her, let's pray for God's grace to go through this. But also, let's pray for his healing through this. Amen. And just pray for his comfort. And uh, with that, if the men can come forward, we'll receive the morning offering. And while they come forward, just want to remind the people that are watching online, you know, you can take part in this part of the service also. If you'd like to give, you can go to our website at friendshipnh.org and give securely through PayPal. I want to point you to that if you'd like to give. Uh, to this ministry also. Brother John, can you ask the Lord's blessing on the ministry and on, on the offering? Heavenly Father, we do again just uh, praise you for everything that you do for us. We praise you for this building that we can come out and serve you and worship you. We pray, Lord, for Pastor Brian as he brings a message that it would uh, just come to us and, and just that we would understand your will for uh, our daily uh, walk with you. And Lord, now as we take this offering, I pray that you would use, help us to understand and use it wisely for the furthering of your kingdom here. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
remains. James chapter 4 as we look to continue our study in the book of James today. James chapter 4 in the New Testament. Look directly after Hebrews. So thankful for the word of God this morning. You know, last week we, we were in James chapter 3. finished up James chapter 3 and it continues into chapter 4 here. We're going to talk about a subject today that is really common between all of us. It's the title of the lesson today is Pollution and Solution in the Heart. You know, today as we come here, we've all been born with a heart condition, haven't we? And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And you know, so many times, even though we might be Christians, 
we still have the old sinful nature that wars against our new nature. And, you know, James is such a practical book. You know, I don't know if you've realized this, but almost every verse that we read, man, it's just so practical and applies to our lives. And I know the Bible is like that, but I'm talking about particularly in the book of James. It just is so relevant to the condition of our spiritual heart and our, and actually our fleshly heart. And so when we read these verses, we're going to go down through uh, verse number 10 today in chapter 4 of the book of James. You know, let's search our hearts and let's, um, let's look to God to just reveal to us, do any of these things apply to us? Or is God pointing his finger at us in any of these things? And if so, let's take care of that today. Let's read together in verse number 1 of James chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Verse number four, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore he says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. You know, can we spend a moment and just ask God to put His searchlight upon our heart this morning and point out anything that needs to be confessed or anything that needs to be right with Him and let's just ask God to, to speak to each and every one of us personally. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the Word of God today. I'm so thankful for the book of James and how you minister to us, Lord, through your Word, but particularly in, in this book as we study it, I pray that you would help us to make practical application of your Word and also just to draw near to you. But Lord, I pray that you would continually do what you tell us in your Word to conform us more to the image of Jesus Christ. We realize that, Lord, while we're here, before we go home to be with you, we don't have that glorified body yet, and our old man still wars against our new man. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to submit to you and to submit to the controlling of the Holy Spirit of God that indwells within us. Lord, there may be those watching online or even here right now that have never known you as, your, as their personal Savior, Lord, if that's the case, I pray that you would help them to realize their great need for you. Lord, that they might place their faith in you and ask you to save them and ask them to ask you to come into their lives and to change them for eternity. Lord, whatever the need is of our sinful hearts today, I pray that you would meet that need. Lord, we're all polluted with sin. We're all polluted with the things in our hearts. But, Lord, you are the solution, and you give us the solution in your word. Help us to act upon that today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at two things in the book of James in chapter 4 today. We're going to look at the pollution in the human heart and the solution for the human heart. You know, a very practical message today, and I hope it, it uh, speaks to your heart because... It speaks to mind. Amen. You know, some, some of the things we're going to talk about here today are things that we might tend to look at and say, well, that's for somebody else. But we need to look at them and say, no, that's for me. Because remember the, the book of James here, this letter to James is going out to a, a church. Amen. It's not just to a lost and dying you know, world. Even though a lost and dying world has, the, has these same symptoms and this same pollution in their heart. But this was happening inside the church in James, in James' time. And it, it can happen right inside of our church and in our hearts. 
And in verse number one, he said, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire to the pleasure that war against your members? You know, he points out here that a wise man is a peace-loving man. And he's reminded that the tragic strife that often exists among God's people can just rip unity apart and rip actually churches apart. Amen. And that's a sad thing. If you've ever been a part of that or even heard about that, it's a very damaging thing. And what causes it all? You know, inevitably, you know, when something happens in our life or in our world, we want to know what's the cause of this? What happened? You know, whether it's a world event, you know, whether it's the, the huge explosion in Beirut this past week. By the way, pray for those families. Over 100 people dead like that slipped into eternity. And inevitably, right away, people want to know, how did this happen? Why did it happen? You know, when things are going on in, in the United States right now, we want to know, how can this happen? Why? We want to get to the bottom of it. Why? So we can learn from our lessons, hopefully, and not just want more information. But we see here, when he asks, where do wars and fights come among you? The pollution of the human heart, he answers the question here. He gets to the root of the problem, and that is envy and wicked desires. Envy and wicked desires. And you know, these wicked desires within us are constantly struggling to be satisfied. And there's a lust to accumulate not only material possessions, but also there's a drive for prestige in there. You know, really, as we look to this, and he gets to this a little later on that we read in this, in this passage of Scripture, the root cause for all of this is a five-letter word that we can all succumb to at times. And it's pride, isn't it? Pride. Do you know we all suffer from that problem? Amen? The people watching online right now suffer from that problem. Whether you know Christ as your Savior or not, we suffer from that condition, don't we? In our hearts. This sin of pride will cause people to spend eternity in hell. Did you know that? Pride looks at me. Pride doesn't look at God. God you know, the, the focus is not on Him. The focus is on me. And if someone don't know Christ as their Savior, pridefully they can say, I'm okay. Things aren't so bad. I can do enough things to earn my way to heaven, to earn a right standing with God. Or maybe after this life it'll just be over. Whatever the case may be, the focus being on ourselves of thinking that we are okay because of something we do or who we are is pride, isn't it? If we puff ourselves up in pride, Paul talked about that. In the New Testament, being puffed up with pride or lifted up, you know, inflated with pride. You know, stick our chest out and say, yes, we're fine. You know, we as Christians do that too, right? We think we're fine when we're not. Sometimes when we put on a ministry smile or a face and we say, hey, everything's good, when it's really not. But going back to if you, if you have never been saved, you need to trust Christ your Savior. You need to receive what he said in the Bible is needed to have a relationship with God. And he doesn't say just clean your act up and become a better person. He doesn't say do enough good things to where one side of the scale might outweigh the other. He says trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because he said I've done everything needed in order for you to have a relationship with me and spend eternity with me in heaven. And that's through my son Jesus Christ. Amen. But because of pride, so many people will reject that. We might not use that word reject, but anything other than accept is reject, amen, when it comes to Christ. But what about when we're saved? What about in the church? What about in our Christian walk? This letter was penned to the church here. He said, where do these wars and fights come among you? Wait a minute. We know Christ is our Savior. Why is there warring? Why is there fighting? Why is there any dissension? Because we still have a sinful heart. 
We're not perfect. We're forgiven. Amen? Judicially, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But he says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members, warring together, warring against the spiritual in your heart? And see, James says in verse number 2, he said, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and, and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You don't have because you don't ask. We know the root of the problem, and that's the problem. Let's look at the fruit of the problem. The fruit of the problem is listed in some of the rest of this chapter. We're going to go through some of these today. He mentioned lust. He mentioned murder and covet and that we can't obtain. We fight more. We don't have because we don't ask. And in verse number three, he says, you ask. And don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. He says, adulterers, adulterers, says you do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Those are some very strong words. Do you know pride he calls us to do a lot of different things. He mentions in verse number four here, covetousness. Do you know covetousness is a form of idolatry? Did you know that? When we say, man, I'm not an idolater. I don't worship idols. I don't have any little statues in my house that I bow down to. He's not just talking about a little statue. Anything that takes the place in your heart and in your life as a higher place than God is an idol. Amen? This is the part we all need to say amen or shake our head and agree with this because this is Bible, folks. Amen? And we can struggle with this. Did you know pride can be an idol? If our pride puffs us up and it takes a higher place than God in our lives, we matter more than God. You know, that's, that's not humility. That's pride. Amen? And what happens, worldliness can creep in. And worldliness, the Bible says here, James says in verse number four, is an enemy with God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Enmity with God. I want you to hold your place in James chapter four and turn over just a few pages to the book of 1 John. 1 John in chapter two. In 1 John chapter two, Beginning in verse number 15. John said in this epistle. He said, do not love the world. Or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now he's talking about here loving the things of the world. And, and desiring to be in the world. He's not talking about loving people. For God so loved the world, that's people. Amen? He's talking about the things of the world. But I want you to notice in verse number 16, he said, For all that is in the world, and he lists three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. It's not God's will that we live worldly lives. The lust of the flesh means physical temptations. Not just sensual, but anything. It's a physical temptation. The lust of the eyes can be greed and envy. We definitely are, are, are looking at that in James chapter 4. The pride of life is an arrogant desire to be recognized. Arrogance. It's a dangerous thing, this fruit of pride, isn't it? What does that look like practically in our lives? You know, sometimes we just talked about in James chapter 3 about our speech. Remember that? How the tongue and we'll, you know, we're not able to bridle our own tongue and our words. And Wow. And we talked about how, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. Maybe we should listen twice as much as we talk sometimes, you know. We need to be very careful if 
all we're ever thinking about when we're talking is kind of bringing it back around to us. You know what I'm talking about? That can be pride if we always need to be the spotlight on us. You see, the tongue is a pride meter. Did you know that? We need to check our pride meters. The way we talk, is it prideful? Does it point to us? Does it puff up ourselves? Do we like to talk about how great we are, how great a job we do, or look at all we've accomplished, look at my pile of toys and stuff? If that's our whole focus, that can be pride, amen? You know, we can say, hey, you know what? Let's use the things that God gives us for the glory of God, amen? Be content with such things that we have. Amen? If God's blessed you with a lot of stuff, amen, use it for his glory. I'm not saying it's a sin to have stuff, amen? Money's not the root of all evil. That's one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. It's the love of money is the root of all evil, amen? But it takes a place higher than, than God. But you see, our human heart wants to gravitate to that pride. And what about, you know, before we go on, and back in James chapter 4, we're going to, pick up our reading. What about when we find ourselves in this place? What about when we find ourselves here and reading the book of James and he says, wow, yes, there's wars, these fights, and they're going on, and you know, even inside of me, what happens when I can look and say, man, I was really prideful in how I dealt with that, or the words that I spoke, or the way I acted. Have you ever been there? What do we do with that? James gives us a solution in just a moment. But he takes us to Scripture. He takes us to Scripture. And before we go there, you know, I want to give us some evidences of what he's talking about in verse number 4. We're going to look at some evidences as he skips through some of these passages of Scripture, some of these verses and we want to be careful when we just pick verses. You know, I'm very big and you know, we need to take the verse. And what does it mean in context of this passage? What does this passage mean in context with the chapter? And the chapter in context with the book. And the book in context with the whole Bible. Amen? But when we look at some of these verses individually and what he says in them, it will give us an idea of some evidences of what he's talking about. Let's, let's look at some evidences here. He, he mentions in verse number one, constant fighting and quarreling. Anybody ever seen that? Anybody ever participated in that constant quarreling and, and fighting about things that aren't going to matter in 100 years from now? It ain't going to matter 100 minutes from now. You know what I'm talking about? But just the constant, just that's the spirit, and that can be an, an evidence of pride in our lives. What about killings? He mentions killings in verse number two. You know, maybe not necessarily taking of another's life, but you know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, if you hate your brother, you've committed, a, you've committed murder in your heart, you know? Does it cause us to actually hate someone? <clears throat> what about a total breakdown in prayer? He mentions that in verse two and three. You know pride will keep you from prayer, Christian. It does me, amen? You want to know if you've got pride in your life and if you've kind of gotten off the path a little bit? Look at your prayer life. Because when we think we're doing fine and we're okay, you know what happens? Sometimes we don't pray as much as we did. We think we've got this. And we've got it on cruise control. But you let something happen in our lives or a difficulty, and you know what happens? Very quickly our prayer life comes back, doesn't it? Because we go back to God. And he reminds us of how we're totally dependent on him. Through the good times and the bad. You know, if we're not spending as much time in prayer, that could be an indicator that we have pride in our life. We need to be very careful with that. What about in verse number two? He mentioned not asking God for spiritual things. He said, You have not because you ask not. Now, you know, as a Christian, we're not talking about. Just a laundry list of things that we're trying to check off things and give God a list like a Christmas list and say, here's what I want you to do. We're praying according to the will of God. Amen. 
And sometimes, even though he knows, he knows the desires of our heart, sometimes we look at this and we can't understand, but he knows what's best for us. Amen. And that doesn't always line up with our requests. And we need to pray according to his will and being able to accept his answer to prayer of either yes or no or later. Amen. Yes, no, or later. Praise God for the times he answers just like that. Sometimes it's later and sometimes it's no. The Apostle Paul sought him three times to remove a thorn that was in his side. And he denied it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. He was going to show the grace of God to Paul in a way that he wouldn't be able to. He didn't have that thorn in his side. That difficulty in his ministry. I believe that was a physical need he had. In verse number three, asking God for sinful things, things that we can consume upon our lust, things that aren't according to the will of God, you know, that can be a symptom of pride in our lives. Lovers of the world, we just went over that in verse number four. Grieving the Holy Spirit of God in verse number five. Let's go to verse number five quickly because we haven't gone over that. Or, you, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? You know... The exact words that he quoted there are not found in the Old Testament scriptures. But you know, I think he's summarizing here some different verses that he says, Don't you know that the scripture says the spirit that dwells in us yearns jealously? And I believe he's talking about this, the Holy Spirit of God that dwells within us. And we need to be careful that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with sin. Amen. He goes on a little later, some, some um, verses that we're not going to cover today, but he talked about slandering. That can be a symptom of pride. Cutting someone down so they'll be lower than you. You know, boasting about the future. You know, that could be a symptom of pride in our lives. We need to, to be careful with that because the solution, he's going to go into the solution here, and this is what's so wonderful about James. He gives us the problem. And then he gives us a solution. The solution for the human heart is, say it with me on the screen, humility. Humility. The opposite of pride is humility. You know, I'd like to tell you that sometimes we can just say, well, I'm just going to be humble today. And that's it. But it doesn't always work that way, does it? You see, it's not just something we say, well, we'll just be humble today. Everything will be fine. We do need to humble ourselves, but you know we need to go to God and we need to realize it's not just being humble. We need to be humble before God. I want you to notice what he says in verse number 6. But he gives more grace. Who needs God's grace this morning? God gives his grace. Amen. Our undeserved favor. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says... God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If we want to know how to have more grace in our lives, well, the Bible says that God resists the proud. We've gone through some evidences of pride and what that means in our lives, and God resists that. But he gives grace to the humble. How do we do that? How do we do that? Notice the Bible says, you know, in James, he says, humble yourself in verse number 6. In verse number 10, he also says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And this act alone results in a twofold blessing. God will give you grace, and he will lift you up in verse number 10. You ever needed to be lifted up by God? That's the opposite of puffing ourselves up and lifting ourselves up. We need God to lift us up. And so he tells us in verse number 7... To submit to God. He says, therefore, submit to God, but also resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Those are in a divine order, by the way. Amen? This is not a mistake. <coughs> submit to God, resist the devil. You ever pray that, Christian? I would suggest you put that on your prayer list every morning. When you pray, God, right now, I submit to you. And I resist the enemy that's set against me, that wants to destroy me. I submit to you right now. I submit to you my life. I submit to you my priorities. I submit to you everything I have, my whole being. I submit to you. And I resist the enemy set against me. 
If we don't think we need that, then we need to backtrack a couple verses and look and see. God resists the proud. Amen. But I want you to notice it doesn't stop there. He says, we need to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And verse number 8, he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. But then he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You don't want to. He's talking about repentance. Verse number 9, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. He said, lament over your sin. Don't just say, oh, God forgive me. Try not to do it again. It should grieve us that we've grieved God with our sin. But I want you to notice when we submit to God, verse number 8, drawing near to God, and he will draw near to you. How does that happen? It happens in prayer. It happens in prayer. Now, it happens when we read the Bible, I understand that, and, and God speaks to our heart. But can I tell you, when we go to God in prayer, that's how we draw near to God. Amen? You ever been there, Christian? You need to draw near to God? You ever look through this chapter that we've just gone through some of these things and you've checked some of these boxes or all the boxes? You know what I'm talking about? I remember some time ago, you know, it's hard to confess sin, isn't it? Is it difficult for anybody else sometimes? Especially the sin of pride? Think about what a 180 this is when we confess pride because it takes the focus off of us and focuses on God. And sometimes we don't do that very forthcoming because of, well, pride. And sometimes we can even get good about confessing our sin or the symptom of our sin without getting to the root cause and say, well, all right, well, God, forgive me for this. I'll do better. Forgive me for this. And you, maybe you prayed and you felt like the, your prayers didn't go any higher than the ceiling. Anybody ever been there? But when we get honest with God and we draw near to God, and that's what it takes is getting honest with God and getting clean with God. Amen. I remember some time ago, you know, I prayed with my wife. I talked to my wife. She's my best friend. And I remember telling her not, you know, too terribly long ago, you know, there was a time I said, you know what? I just don't, I just don't like the person I am right now. You ever woke up and said that? I just don't like who I am today. I'm a Christian. I'm, I didn't stop being a Christian or anything like that. We're sealed to the day of redemption. But I said, you know what? I don't like who I am right now. And that was the Holy Spirit of God. And how I came to that is, you know, I, I you know, everybody has hardships and things in their lives. But, you know, I was praying one day, and it's like the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah, you know, I can't even remember what I was praying. All of a sudden, he just kind of crushed my heart, and I started getting real honest with God and saying, God, you know, I, I told him, I don't like who I am right now. And it's like, I didn't hear an audible voice, so don't get me wrong here. But it's like the Spirit of God said, now we can get somewhere. And he started pointing out a couple things. Yes, you're right, God. I confess that. Forgive me for that. Pointed out something. Yes, forgive me for that, God. I'm sorry. I'm not going to justify this anymore. You know? Whether it be whatever it is. I'm not even going to go into what it was. But you know, ultimately it was pride that caused me to feel that way. Because God wasn't in the right place of priority in those couple areas, you know? You know what happened? He changed me. When I confessed that. I didn't like who I was. I liked who I was when I got through praying that day. You know why? Because I drew near to God and I submitted to Him. And I confessed that to Him. And friends, there's no other feeling like it is to be clean. Amen? To be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm not just talking about the point of salvation. I'm talking about when we sin and say, God, oh, would you forgive me? Man, I, I was prideful. Would you forgive me? And truly repent. There's nothing like it. Amen? It's a wonderful feeling. And the very pride that we resist that, we have to look back and say, why did I even resist that? Amen? Because we want to walk with God. But pride.
praying and getting, just getting honest with God and submitting to God. Well, very quickly, I want to go through just some, some quick things, some very basic principles to praying. You know that James goes through verse number 6. He says, when we pray, ask in faith. Notice he says, he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Friends, we need to pray, and we need to ask in faith. Secondly, he tells us in verse number 3, when we pray, we need to pray with the right motives. We need to pray that his will be done. We need to pray, God, would you help me to pray according to the will of God? Help me to pray that I'm on the same page with you, God. You place the desire upon my heart. When we pray, we need to pray according to his will. He covers this a little later in James number, uh, chapter number 4, verse 15. says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. In 1 John chapter 5, you don't have to turn over there. I'll turn over there for us. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 14, the Bible says, now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us according to His will. Isn't that a wonderful verse? According to his will. Praying according to his will. When we pray, we need to be in right relationship with others. Ooh, there's a tough one. You might say, I'm good with God. I've confessed everything. What about your relationship with others? Is there a relationship strained with others? Or, you know, is there somebody we need to forgive? Is there somebody we need to make restitution? Is there somebody we need to go to? Is there somebody we need to receive? We need to be in right relationship with others. And by the way, especially in the context of church, amen? Especially in the context of a church family. Let's be in right relationship with one another. When we pray, already confess sins in our own lives. You know, in Psalm 66 and verse 18, the Bible says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Bible says the Lord will not hear me. Boy, isn't that a strong word. If I'm not willing to confess my sin, if I'm regarding iniquity, practicing iniquity in my life and won't confess that I'm harboring that sin, the Bible says that you won't even hear me when I pray. That's very consistent with James because he resists the proud. Amen? He won't even hear. Friends, that's a very dangerous word there. If the Lord won't even hear our prayer. He, he takes sin very seriously, doesn't he? And this sin of pride is one of the most dangerous, dangerous sins that we can commit. Lastly, in verse number 10, the Bible says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. <clears throat> If we honestly take our place at his feet, he will lift us up in due time. This is how we should respond to God when we confess sin. When we go before him and ask for things we have need of. When we ask him for help. When we ask him for protection. We ask him for protection not to be in the world or not to want the things of the world. To be satisfied with his provision. When we look to him and say, God, would you protect me from the enemy that's set against me and wants to destroy me? When we go to him and say, God, just as we sang today in worship, I need you. You know, there's a very definite difference between a need and a want. Ever preach that, dads? Preach that in your home to your kids. There's a difference in a need and a want. We could say, God, I want you. But when we get to the point and say, God, I need you. I desperately, desperately need you. Friends, 
that's humility. Amen? That's humility. God, I need you. I need you to work in my life. I need you to forgive me for my sin. I need you to help me in this area of my life. And can I tell you, there's not an area of our life that we need God more than when it comes to our souls. Amen? Many of you know what I'm talking about, but God is the only solution to the pollution of our heart. Amen? He's the only solution, the only remedy to this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And praise God, He knew, God knew that the way we are, we don't have to stay that way. He gave us a solution. And the solution is Jesus Christ. He sent His Son to die on the cross for our sin. For God so loved the world, that's us, that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, forever life, eternal life. Amen? If you want that today, you have to receive that gift of grace. We humble our hearts and say, God, I can't do it, you can. Amen? And we receive Him as our Savior. But even if you are on that journey, even if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, my friend, we still have a prideful heart. And James gives us a checklist here of how to deal with that. And let me just remind us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And we need to submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you and draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen? The Bible says it. You see, we base this on the word of God. This is God's revelation to man. He tells us how to have a relationship with him. He tells us how to spend eternity in heaven. He tells us how to live our lives. He even tells us when we slip and fall, how to restore that right relationship with him. So where are you at in this journey? Where are you at? What stage are you at? This very practical book gives us instruction. Here's some symptoms. Here's how to remedy those symptoms. Amen. In other words, here's the pollution. Here's the solution. So where are you at? Where are we at today, friendship? Did God touch your heart with anything? Well, humility would say, Amen, God, thank you for showing that to me. I want to get that right with you. Pride would say, that's not really a problem. I don't know why I thought of that over and over again. Whether you're here or you're watching online with us, maybe you say, you know what? God really touched my heart that I need to trust him to go to heaven. Humility would say, yes, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. Pride would say, no, I've got this and I'll do it at a later time or I'll after I clean things up or whatever the case may be. Humility is submitting to God. Amen. And that's what we need to do, submit to God. We can do that right here, right now. As we stand, we're going to close with a word of prayer. You know, in this time of prayer, we need to do just what James says. We need to draw near to God, and God will draw near to us. Amen? So whether here or you're watching right in your living room, you can draw near to God right now in prayer. Amen? I'm going to give you just a moment to pray. And I trust God has spoken to your heart today. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for watching online today. You know, let's, before we dismiss, let's don't leave here. Let's don't leave this precious time we have this side of heaven without being 100% right with God. <clears throat> Folks, it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling to be right with God. Amen? And to know that you know that you know that you and the Savior are in perfect fellowship together because of what He's done for us. Amen? Let's stand. And I am going to ask Brother Mike Sloan if you could close us with a word of prayer in just a moment. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Let's remember to tune in on Wednesday at 6 p.m. for our Bible study on Facebook Live. And kids, we're going to have another Kids Devo, 3 o'clock on Friday, this Friday. And let's be thinking about who we can invite to church next Sunday. One other prayer request, if we could. If, um, I know we mentioned Winnie earlier. Folks, if we could pray for those churches and the Bible-believing churches in the state of California today, they're meeting this morning 
a lot of them, and under really persecution. And so let's pray for them that they could remain true to the Word of God. And let's pray for God's strength even through this, that, that God would, you know what happens in, in the world when God's church is persecuted. You know what happens? It usually expands. And let's ask God to do that during this time of persecution when really uh, they're saying that they lawfully can't meet. And a lot of them are saying we have a mandate from Scripture to meet. Let's, let's pray that God would strengthen them and that God would just bring forth his gospel in a mighty way and fill those people with the Spirit of God today. Amen. Brother Mike, can you close us with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask that you be with this congregation. Uh, let us submit the, your will in, your, in our lives and uh, be with those uh, churches out in uh, California, Lord, and that are being persecuted. Uh, give them the power to stand up for what they believe and, and what uh, we are supposed to follow you, Lord, and just uh, be with us and bless us and help us through this day and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.